Welcome to uh, Jerky Making with Louie and Lewis from Louie's Finer Meats up in Cumberland. Uh, my name is Mike Scott. I'm the program director at Farm Table Foundation. And it's just always nice to connect with folks, even if it's in this way. So thank you for joining us over Zoom for your interest in Farm Table and our mission, uh, which is to build local food culture. And certainly one part of local food culture around here is, is good meat and venison and Louie and Lewis know a ton about that and, and whether you've got venison in your freezer or some other kind of meat you might want to make into jerky that's what we'll be focusing on tonight. So in our mission to build local food culture we try to support local businesses like Louie and Lewis and Louie's Finer Meats in Cumberland. We so we purchased most of our food at the restaurant. We have a local foods restaurant if you don't know that. Um, we purchase most of it from local farmers from within 40 miles. And we seek to, in doing that, support the local economy and build community and support conservation efforts as well. I also just want to mention that uh, a thanks to Marine Mills Folk School. You might see in the chat box, I've already put their mission and their uh, website, Marine Mills Folk School. There's a lot of good classes and they're helping to co-sponsor this class. So I want to thank them for that. Everybody and Louie and Lewis, please feel free to introduce yourself a little more. And then I know they want to start with the PowerPoint. So go ahead. Okay, hello everybody. Um, and uh, again, we're from uh, Louis Finer Meats in Cumberland. And uh, so we're going to start out here with a little bit of background and a PowerPoint presentation. And then we'll uh, demonstrate making some jerky and uh, and then the, the biggest thing is that we uh, want to make sure that uh, you're able to ask any questions that you want. Um, so, you know, anytime during the presentation or uh, certainly at the end of it, uh, we'll try to provide plenty of time for that. So, uh, if anybody uh, had seen our PowerPoint before, this little uh, 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 talking about Louis' uh, history and so on and so forth, so just bear with us. Uh, jerky has got to be such a huge business. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's a real popular item in our store. It's labor intensive. And we uh, want to encourage people to try to make it at home. I made it at home before we had even a store. It's easy to do without a lot of equipment or anything like that. And your imagination can go crazy with it. So hopefully you can learn a couple things here and, and uh, uh, put your best foot forward on developing your own jerky or or be more familiar with the process that goes behind it. Okay. So, uh, so we'll go through our PowerPoint here to uh, start us out here, give a little background about uh, jerky and about uh, our business, and then we can uh, go from there. Uh, this is our original store in downtown Cumberland. We opened that in 1970. If so if you do the math, we uh, didn't pick a very good year to celebrate our 50th anniversary. Uh, we've been in business for 50 years. Uh, in 1978, we moved up to our present location and added on about five times. And the bottom picture is what it looks like right now. Uh, this is my grandfather, the first Louis, and his brother, George. They immigrated from Germany, and um, they had a butcher shop in Chicago in the uh, 1930s. So there's another shot of the original uh, store there, which was uh, very small. If you're familiar with Cumberland, it's uh, currently the Chamber of Commerce office in downtown, but it's, uh, it was a, a good start, but certainly a, a small location as a business group. Oh, there's my my dad. Uh, the, I guess if you figure it out, he's Louis II. And he, uh, that's a load of summer sauce that came out of our um, Smokehouse in the old store in downtown Cumberland. Uh, follow a picture of my brother and, and uh, Joan and uh, my dad behind the meat counter. I, the prices aren't quite accurate right now. Uh, so in 1978, uh, we purchased uh, uh, abandoned building up. There was implements dealership, and that's what it looked like then. And we uh, remodeled it and Moving forward, 92, we put on a, a, a big uh, um, expansion to the south. And it was like this for many, quite a few years. Uh, we purchased a liquor store uh, next door and uh, uh, 
which was adjacent to our property. And uh, my, my sister-in-law is managing it now and we eventually tore it down and built a new one there, which you can see in these uh, pictures here. And that was uh, uh, like six years ago now. So we're in a beautiful lake country. Uh, we have uh, uh, lots of lakes, a lot of tourist people. These are pictures up here where we have our annual worst fest. Um, we have that in September. Uh, you can see all the traffic and people we had there. And uh, we had to cancel, of course, last year, but hopefully this year will be bigger and better in September. So you can see that we keep uh, adding on trying to uh, keep changing with the times. Um, we, uh, to show some of the European German heritage here, we have yeah, this is kind of a, a sightseeing thing, this uh, maypole with uh, a local artist uh, designed all these signs with uh, you know, things of local or family significance on them. And uh, so this would be done in Germany and several other European countries, usually um, on May Day in the spring to put up a maypole, but ours is up uh, year round. Uh, we're just promoting local uh, businesses and local things that are dear to our heart, like skiing and hunting and Boy Scouts and garden country, of course. And some family heritage. Uh, a big part of our uh, um, mission here is we compete every year. Of course, this last year was shut down, but we compete with four different events every year. One is the uh, state fair at the Wisconsin State Fair in Milwaukee. And then there's a national show at going around to different spots throughout the year. Um, this Coming summer, it's both, uh, apparently it's scheduled for Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Uh, last year was scheduled for Des Moines and it's been in Kansas City and different cities like that. Then there's always an, a state show, which is always in Madison. Then every three years there's an international competition. And uh, in addition to uh, participating in uh, these sausage and cured meats uh, contests that we also uh, serve as judges, we. Uh, you know, usually go every year to judge at Minnesota's contest. Well, now, which is in March, well, now it was just canceled for the second year in a row, of course. But uh, we've done it there. We've done it in Indiana, South Dakota, several other states that uh, serve as a judge. And we've learned a lot by judging as well, because you really become a critic when you're comparing, uh, you know, you might have several different uh, jerkies or snack sticks or sausages, whatever category you're judging. And, most of them are good and you have to look for the best of the best, so. So if I have to judge bacon and I have 47 bacons to judge, I don't wanna go see my uh, cardiologist the next day. Uh, there's uh, the generations there, uh, myself, my son, Lewis, who's here, my father, my brother, Jim, and my brother, Bill goes back two years ago, but I'm better looking now than I was then. Our business philosophy, since we're just an independent small business, is um, we don't have a, a, a network to, to lean on, is customer service, product quality, uh, communication, community service, and we like to compete. Here we have a, a brunch uh, house, and we have 40, 50 different groups that come during the year and they, uh, 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 as a fundraiser. And uh, obviously this group here is Project Fan. Meat industry challenges, um, it's labor intensive. Uh, it's highly regulated, it's expensive. The utilities, equipment, insurance are high, highly competitive. Gas stations are selling meat now and everybody's in the arts are selling meat, everybody's selling meat. Highly competitive, uh, like I just said, a perishable product, um, changing technology and you have to keep on top of. Uh, we have daily inspection from the state of Wisconsin. So we have to be on our, uh, you know, on, on the cutting edge there. Um, then economic trends, you don't know what's gonna happen one day to the next. And then consumer trends, some days it's allergens, some days it's health, sometimes they don't care. So uh, you have to try to cater to a wide range of customers people that are semi-vegetarian all the way to the, the hardcores 
So it's it's a, a, a challenge. We have to try to be something for everybody on a certain level to be competitive. And then there's always anticipated challenges, of course, uh, you know, in the last year here, you know, my dad here just said to me, well, in 50 years in our scene like this, I don't know what to tell you when the COVID hit and everything went crazy. Um, but probably feel better now than uh, we did a year ago at this time when it was first hitting. So um, part of our success is that we're uh, involved with different trade associations and that helps us out for as far as networking with fellow processors, the communication with suppliers, doing different uh, work, going to different workshops and so on and so forth. So we, we're not just like a, a butcher in a supermarket. This is our profession and we like to go to all these different things to learn things. Uh, right in front of me, I have a book that's called Jerky, Jerky Manufacturing Workshop. I have another manual that's called the Jerky Journal. Two different workshops that we attended, uh, just learning about jerky. Just the, that's all it was. Um, our services, uh, we have a, a retail meat counter that's uh, uh, open seven days a week. We cut meats to order. Uh, we have a small deli without, we don't make sandwiches and things like that, but we got a, a, we have like a hundred different kinds of cheeses and 50 some different kinds of deli meats. Uh, we have meat bundles and gift boxes and in-store bakery. Internet sales has gotten big with the uh, COVID stuff. Home sausage making, which we're doing in front of your garden country right now. Weekly specials, meat and cheese trays, gift cards, and then of course the liquor store. So. so let's get back to jerky. That's what we came here for. So sorry about that dog and pony show, but you know, that's, we have to come out on this somehow. We, we right now we make uh, uh, over 30 varieties of, of beef jerky. Um, I guess on the beef side, we have like a teriyaki, uh, beef Cajun, sweet and hot. Uh, we have a, a regular traditional. Uh, and then on the uh, pork, we make a pork jerky also that has, uh, we have honey barbecue, Cajun. Um, uh, help me out to the Traditional list. pork. Traditional pork. And then also then we make uh, several varieties of kippered style, which is a thicker jerky, which we'll talk about later. Uh, different uh, maple habanero and turkey, you know, chicken and uh, uh, beef and pork, of course, too. Um, go ahead. So the history of jerky, well, like a lot of meat products, the, the reason jerky was invented, and I think uh, various cultures around the world uh, made jerky, it was just simply a way to uh, a form of preservation when there was uh, no refrigeration. So, um, and that's the only way that they could uh, preserve it. So whatever kind of meat they had and they couldn't eat it right away, you know what happens if it's hot out that's going to spoil. So they found ways to uh, dry it and make uh, jerky so that uh, they could preserve it and save it for a long time. I think if our inspector came and saw that we had something like this out back that we wouldn't be in business for very long, but it worked for them. We won't tell anybody. <laughs> and uh, so I guess this brings back there's with, with a lot of products, there's a reason why it was made originally. And now, you know, it's became popular again, just as a snacking item, but it's also valuable for preservation still, if you're going hiking or hunting or doing something where you're not gonna have refrigeration with you that. Uh, we, we have people going to the Boundary Waters and, and they have us vacuum pack up uh, uh, a bunch of jerky to take with them. Or some moms are uh, sent it to their sons in Iraq and um, Kuwait and whatever, because it can travel overseas for a long time without spoilage. So um, jerky is, uh, it's usually uh, you want to use uh, lean meat uh, and it's cut into strips uh, thin and then basically it's dried to prevent spoilage. I mean, basically uh, bacteria can't grow without water. So it, uh, and at least according to the definition that we found that jerky is derived from, uh, I don't know exactly how to pronounce the tribe, but it's a tribe from uh, Peru and uh, which means dried salted meat, charqui. Louis and Lewis, I have a question here. Um, 
maybe you'll get into this later, but do you offer nutrition info on the different marinades and flavors? For example, could you provide the carbs and sugar for teriyaki or honey and so on? Or is, is that something we, you uh, we can provide an estimate. We don't have uh, the full nutrition facts label on all of our uh, products as a, a smaller uh, processor. We're uh, exempt from some of the requirements, but we try to figure it out, um, you know, a close estimate because there's certainly a lot of customers who are uh, uh, concerned about that. Um, and, and that depends on the type of jerky that we have one that's uh, called sweet and hot jerky where it, it's just that it does have quite a bit of sugar, but it also has a lot of spice versus our you know, original would have less sugar. So there's different options there depending on what kind. So if, if someone wanted to find that out, would, would calling you be the best way to, to get that information? Yeah, call or uh, email. Or email, come on in, okay. And I also wanted to let you know that we've already had one comment by Johnny saying, I love your jerky. I always ship at home to California when I visit. We'll get you on the payroll then. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> so uh, what we call whole muscle jerky is uh, probably what you usually think of when you think of jerky, where it's uh, a piece that's a uh, slice thin, where it's uh, not ground, it's the actual uh, piece. And as we said, if you uh, cut it uh, thicker, we would call it kippered, kippered beef. And uh, the challenge with that is if it's a thicker piece, it's a lot harder to uh, dry. So if I was doing it at home, I'd start with slicing it pretty thin, and then you can experiment from there. Um, and this can be a uh, beef, pork, venison, uh, goose, what, uh, turkey, uh, whatever you can slice thin. It's, it, it's not a prejudice. And, you know, we would, uh, recommend since you know you probably don't have a slicer at home that uh, you, know, you could go like to a, a meat market such as ours or uh, anywhere and uh, you could order it you may have to uh, order a day or two in advance just because uh, you know if they can't slice raw meat on the same slicer as a deli slicer until uh, without cleaning it in between so keep that in mind but usually you can buy a thin sliced meat which we'll be showing you here once we uh, do the demonstration. Um, or you can uh, do pretty well by, uh, you know, slicing as thin as you can with a knife. It's not. It helps to chill it, chill a little bit to firm it up a little bit so it's not sloppy and you get a better uh, edge on it that way. A couple of people have asked, what do you have a definition of thin? Quarter inch, eight inch, eight inch? A quarter inch to, uh, is ideal to three eighths and some, some right in that a neighborhood uh, uh, that, you know, it's all, it, it, the, the key to it is to try to keep it as uniform as possible. So when you're cooking it, it all come or dry in it, that it comes out about the same, you know, all the time. Um, but a quarter inch uh, is, is usually the rule of, of, of thumb. Which, uh, with it. which might be a little thicker than you're picturing when you see the finished jerky, but keep in mind that, that it uh, shrinks at a, you know, you want the weight as we'll get into to cut in about half. So it comes out uh, way thinner than your original slice was after you uh, dehydrated. Um, so the other type of jerky is uh, what's called a restructured jerky or ground jerky. And that is the uh, same thing you would take lean meat, but instead of slicing it, you would uh, grind it and then you'd form it into a uh, jerky. We you know, do make some of this. We certainly make a lot more of the whole muscle jerky. But some people might like this because you can use uh, any kind of trimmings from uh, your deer or beef or whatever you have um, versus having to save uh, you know, the, what you want for roast or steak. So it's just a different option. And then uh, as I mentioned here, kipper is a thicker cut like steak strips that probably wouldn't you know, you're not going to be able to dry it as much as jerky. And so if you get into labeling issues, there's definitions between kippered and jerky, depending on the, how much it's dried. But uh, there's a, a picture of our uh, kippered beef. Uh, I briefly talked about the different meat selections, beef, pork, venison, wild game, um, 
So any kind of meat is good, providing that it doesn't have a lot of sinew in it, or cartilage, it's a whole muscle, um, and it's lean. Uh, if you add the other things into it, all of a sudden it gets too chewy, or it's the fat can get rancid, or it's not, it doesn't dry like meat, lean meat does. Um, we like to have a little bit of uh, uh, bark in the meat, like you see there. Um, it seems it makes it just a little more tender, a little more flavorful. But you can't have like a ribeye steak or something like that where you have lots of lots of fat. So, you know, if you're uh, trying to uh, select the meat for beef, we would usually use uh, the round, which is a big piece that you can slice and it's pretty lean. And uh, you know, if you want to make it more tender, you could use something like sirloin that's more tender, but just so that it's something that's uh, fairly lean. And same thing on the, the deer, you normally uh, use the hindquarters, which is the, the same thing. Um, instead of making roast, you could slice that meat into a uh, jerky meat and make jerky out of it. But, uh, you know, really you can use anything that's a big enough piece to slice that's, a, that's lean. With a goose, a lot of people slice up the goose breast or their turkey breast. Same thing, it's a, a big uh, piece that you can get slices off of that's, uh, that's lean. And so, um, you know, here uh, I would uh, trim off some of that fat on that um, so that uh, you have a nice lean uh, piece that you can slice. And you want everything to be of uh, high quality to start with. You know, you can't uh, make something good out of something poor. So it, any of the usual food safety, food quality issues, I mean, especially with uh, wild game is that you want to keep everything clean and cold. And uh, you know, if it's already starting to spoil before you make something, it's not gonna get any better. Um, and you don't wanna have a whole bunch of uh, gristle or connective tissue in there also, because uh, this, I mean, you do want jerky to be chewy, but not that chewy. And uh, that if it's partially frozen, it's actually a little easier to uh, slice. So you can keep that in mind if you can just get to partially freeze. And it's a little easier to work with sometimes. Uh, Louis, and we have one question that came in just going back to um, the Kippard uh, meats. Is Kippard the same or similar to, to Biltong? Um, I, I believe so. You know, we haven't uh, made that, but yeah, it would be a similar sort of uh, product. I mean, technically, the definition of uh, Kippard versus jerky is. Uh, a test on how much it's dried. And so a kipper is actually a dried less than jerky is in the regulation book. Um, but, you know, we achieve that by making it thicker. And then, uh, you know, and then there's also the chance that it might not be as uh, shelf stable as jerky if it's not dried as much. So that's the other issue if you're looking at the shelf stability. Um, the, uh, so you're slicing it. Well, it says here there's a, uh, there's actually a difference of opinion on which way you should, should slice jerky. I kind of prefer, as it shows here, to slice it uh, against the grain um, like you would with steaks. And to me, it comes out more tender. Uh, some people prefer to cut it uh, with the grain. So then, you know, it kind of pulls apart in strips and it's a little chewier. So really you can do it either way, the, um, depending on what you prefer for the final texture. I and mean, we want to experiment with that and see what you like better. But uh, basically, uh, you know, you're gonna take this nice lean piece of meat here and slice it into those uh, quarter inch uh, pieces. And then, uh, and you can keep that in mind with the thickness that, um, you know, if you slice it thinner, you'll be able to dry it more quickly. But if it's uh, thicker, you might get the texture you like better. So it's just, it's something that you can experiment with at home as far as the, the thickness you prefer. Uh, marinating seasoning, um, the Ziploc bags, God bless them, you know, it works good for a lot of things, or a big plastic bag. What's good about them is that, that you can, uh, once in a while, move it around a little bit to, to, to enhance the marinating process, plus it's sealed so it doesn't dry, and, and you can kind of keep an eye on it a little bit. Um, they always recommend uh, non-metal container, plastic uh, bowl, glass bowl, 
um, best sort of thing. And there's even, uh, if you saw behind us, I have a, a 500 pound and a thousand pound tumbler that we can use for bacon, jerky and hams. But here's like a little uh, five pound home tumbler where the, you put the meat and everything in there and it slowly uh, turns and, and the meat kind of flops, gets each other and it gets a baffle in the tumbler, which uh, speeds up the marinating process. And usually on most models would draw a vacuum so it actually can uh, kind of suck the marinade right into the meat. Uh, you don't need a whole lot of equipment, like you know, there's a big commercial type slicer there, but uh, the, I, there's uh, jerky boards that I've seen. Uh, they're slicing the jerky as it is at so the bottom. Um, uh, you can purchase the meat. Um, that, that's the slicing end of it. And of course, a good sharp knife. Yeah, you know, it looks to me on this meaty slicing here on the bottom uh, left there, is, looks to me like that's partially frozen, which, uh, like you said, can make it a little easier. Of course, if it's all the way frozen, you're not going to be able to slice it. So there's a, a fine line, but. Um, a jerky gun, it's like a, a, a cock gun, which is a, a spinoff of that. And this is if you were going to make the restructured or the ground jerky. So you, you, you'd mix up the, the meat and uh, the lean meat, season it, put it in that gun, and then extrude it out onto a screen. Um, we sell some of those, not a lot of them, but uh, um, it's a one way of use if you want, if you don't have the muscle or you just want to use up some of your ground hamburger or ground venison, you certainly can do it like that. Um, it's not authentic jerky, but it's uh, another option. So, and, you know, maybe we'll show you some of the commercial size equipment that we have here, but, you know, we're talking about doing it at home, obviously. So, you're, depending on where your equipment is, which we'll go into further, you can see a smoker there with a rack synth you can lay it on. So, if you have a way to uh, lay it flat on racks, that's uh, the way that we do it here. With the other ways that you can hang jerky, you can see in that bottom left picture where they took the slice of meat and they're hanging them by skewers and drying it out that way. And that also works well. The, the important part is to be able to have airflow. So the, the, the air can get around the product. It's ideally, you can see like at the top picture, the pieces aren't touching. There's some gaps in there so the air can circulate through there. Um, and don't get scared away if you don't have a dehydrator, if you don't have a smokehouse. You can still use like a, uh, even your oven at home, providing you can keep the door propped open for air circulation and for controlling temperature so it doesn't get too hot is the key. And you can see also um, <clears throat> the jerky that's hung by those uh, skewers that is spaced out so that the air can get all the way around it. If, uh, you know, it's kind of tempting to say, well, how much can I fit in there? And they can get more done this way, but that doesn't uh, turn out as good or as fast because uh, you have to have the air circulation flowing well for it to uh, dry out, which is what you're trying to do. Uh, there's a, a dehydrator rack, a uh, couple options there. Um, for, and, you know, dehydrators can be used for drying fruit or drying herbs or drying a lot of things, but one of those things is jerky. But you really, really need to be able to control the temperature. Um, and be able to facilitate uh, good airflow. And the one thing we'll touch on a little bit is, uh, now if you tell me, uh, you know, people have been uh, making jerky for thousands of years without fully cooking it, you know, I'm not going to argue with that, but we have to recommend that you should at some point be bringing it up to a, a fully cooked temperature. The, the reason being is that uh, you know, drying stops bacteria from growing, but does not kill any bacteria that are already there. So there's been cases where people made that jerky in a dehydrator, which, uh, you know, most dehydrators don't cook it. And then, uh, so they dried it good, but they still got sick from it because they, they didn't kill whatever was on it. And uh, so that's something to keep in mind that uh, if you're using a dehydrator, that works great, but you may want to put it into a oven or something to uh, fully cook it at the end. And it doesn't take very long to get it up to temperature because uh, 
It's only 160 degrees. You just want to get up to 160 degrees and it doesn't take very long because it's such a thin piece. Uh, we I talked about the oven that's propped open. Um, ideally, you don't want to do it around the 4th of July, but it's not a bad thing to do in January. Um, here on the pitch on the right, where people are actually hanging it, that's a little closer than what I'd like to see it, but and that's not really jerky, it's more of a kippered product. Um, you can see where people laid it out on the oven rack on the bottom right. Uh, of course, you don't want to have all of the, the if, if, if the husband does that and the wife comes home and you've got a molasses in the bottom that's baked in, you don't want that. So make sure that you have some sort of a um, um, aluminum foil or something to catch the drippings off, off of it. Um, the finished product goal of jerky, at least from the state standpoint, if we want to call it jerky, if, if start, we started out with 10 pounds, we need to have five pounds. That's one of the reasons why jerky could be expensive. Um, right, out of the gate, right out of the gate, not only is it labor intensive, but you need to have that yield. If it does not meet that, then we have to call it smoked beef strips or kippered beef or something different than jerky. Um, you don't want some people, I've seen in some books where like, I can't believe how hot they're cooking it at. You don't want it crunchy. I mean, that's ridiculous, but you don't want it soft and, and whatnot. Rubbery, you want, you want and rubbery, you want it uh, to have a, a nice chewy texture of it um, to, to call it jerky. Now we're talking about quality a little bit. And the same thing though, with these different textures is a lot of it does come back to personal preference and you may have to experiment with how dry you want to get it to uh, get what you prefer. So I always have to touch a little bit on food safety, which I uh, talked about there a little bit, and, and but that's part of why we make jerky is that you're taking out the, the water, which uh, the bacteria need to survive. Um, and also, uh, oxygen that if uh, you're keeping a long time that you may want to seal it. And because uh, that's the other thing with drying it jerky, if you uh, you know keep it without packaging, it might actually reabsorb moisture back in and no longer be as dried. So that's something to think about over time. Um, and you know your raw meats, you always want to keep them cold at a desirable temperature. You know, as we said, jerky, if you uh, may it correctly and dried enough, then the temperature is not so important afterwards because it becomes a, a shelf stable product. And the, you know, you always uh, want to watch for, uh, we've talked about the cooking and cooling, um, but the cross contamination is another issue, especially uh, you know, if you're using a wild game, you just want to make sure that uh, you keep everything clean and you don't uh, contaminate something that uh, just keep in mind that you know you're going to be eating it, of course. So, uh, keep all products clean and cold. I never defrost at room temperature, even though it's tempting. Separate large amount of foods in a small shallow container before cooling or freezing. Um, personal safety, of course. A lot of times you've got. Uh, fat on the floor or, or water in the floor, or you're distracted or you're laughing and talking and having a good time. But it's serious business too with the uh, knives and the grinding equipment and stuffing equipment. It's cold. Uh, sometimes you got power, you got heat. Um, uh, so just be alert. We just want everybody to be safe and have a good time. Um, non meat ingredients, when it comes to jerky, it's simpler than a lot of things. There's salt. It's the most important ingredient. Uh, that's what's preserving it, that's helping it. You can control the salt if you've got salt issues. A lot of times jerky's got a bad reputation because it can be too salty, but you can control that. Um, but that's part of the preservation process. And water, it aids in mixing. And, and jerky is one of those things where you don't use a lot of it because sometimes instead of water, we'll use uh, different marinades. Uh, there's a whole host of them out there there's everything from Tabasco to soy sauce to Worcester sauce to uh, different flavored ones. And we can show you a few of those when we start our uh, 
uh, on hand's presentation. You know, any water or liquid that you're adding to jerky, you're going to end up uh, removing when you dry it anyways, but um, it seems to help to uh, use a little bit of water to help aid in mixing or if you're using a marinade. We just had a, a good question come in about the salt. Does it matter what kind of salt you use or do you have suggestions about the kind of salt to use? Well, you know, a lot of times the salt is salt, is salt um, uh, but, you know, the uh, sometimes for labeling purposes, people say sea salt. Uh, one of the reasons we don't use sea salt here on a big basis is because it's inconsistent depending on what part of the sea it came from. And it, it could be, you know, different minerals and, and other things that are in it. So we like to be able to know, uh, we like to have it consistent. So naturally non-iodized, uh, 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 a good uh, table salt or something like that is fine. It's all pretty pure and it's pretty uniform. Um, but, you know, there again, you can, um, you know, there's Himalayan salts and there's sea salt, of course, and, you know, things like that they can use. But here we've just been using a, a, a purified, pure um, um, table salt without any anything else. So, well, you said it's non-iodized, is that right? Non-iodized, of course, yeah. Yep. Okay. And then Scott asked, what's the main difference between a marinade and a cure? Um, we can... Uh, Maybe when the, because you're not seeing us in camera right now, right? So if we get through the PowerPoint, maybe we'll show that. But it would be a liquid that you're, uh, put in. it could be the same thing, but it's a, a marinade that has all the ingredients in it. Um, you know, a liquid. We'll show some examples of that. Sounds good. And Robin asks, why is it important to use non-iodized salt? It wouldn't be a deal breaker. It's just that it's one less thing that you have to use as a uh, an issue. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people have and will and continue to use it. I, I don't see any big uh, issue there. Do you, Lois? I don't think so. Um, just, I think on a home basis, I don't know if it would make much difference either way. I think for us on a commercial basis is just part of the labeling and the trying to make sure it's consistent every time. Sugar is a big part of, of jerky. Uh, we uh, have been using um, brown sugar in a lot of our jerkies, uh, but there's uh, and molasses, there's maple syrup, there's um, uh, corn syrup, uh, there's different types of sugars that as well. And one thing it does is it cuts the harshness of the salt a little bit. And it also makes it a little more uh, tender uh, and um, gives, when, when, and when you are cooking it in the, your dehydrator or your oven like that, it's, it's not necessarily caramelizing, but it gives it a little darker tone, which is a more desirable color in jerky. Um, uh, as, as far as spices goes, there's a, uh, you can be own, your own artist. I mean, you know, there, you can use ghost pepper and habanero if you're strong enough for that, or you can use uh, tomato type stuff for more of a barbecue bend, blend. And there's all the onions and garlics and all the different herbs and spices and all the wonderful uh, condiments and stuff uh, that, that um, go there again, uh, uh, there's a lot of pre blend recipes which we'll show you, which is easier. Uh, I would, one of the things we'd like recommend is use a pre blend one, but then you can doctor it up or zip it up to your own specifications. If you like more garlic, or if you like more sugar, or if you like more heat or less heat or more cracked pepper, you can go from there. And that's where it kind of gets fun. You can kind of make whatever you want. If uh, you start with the base recipe and then you can kind of add to it depending on what you like, if you want it sweet or spicy or whatever. Um, and one other little thing I'll add about salt and sugar, just in the science of it, that those do, uh, both salt and sugar do bind up some water, uh, which means that, uh, that it uh, is that much less you have to dry out. So something to keep in mind if there's salt and sugar in there that helps with the drying process to uh, dry it a little easier. 
basic jerky recipe, um, you know, if the, the, without all the bells and whistles and all the fancy stuff that we were talking about, basic jerky recipe would have salt, some sort of sugar, white, brown, maple, honey, ground black pepper, some cayenne or ground red pepper, of course, onion and garlic, uh, curing salt, uh, the, the, uh, the background marinade like a soy sauce or um, Worcestershire is good. And then if you're using a oven or a dehydrator, uh, a little liquid smoke sparingly um, was, uh, is, is good to get a smoky flavor, which you wouldn't get if you don't have a smokehouse that you're putting it into. And just with liquid smoke is uh, a little bit goes a long ways, um, but it's definitely a way to uh, get a little bit of smoky flavor if you're not smoking it. And there's just what I was talking about, but it's kind of broken down uh, by uh, amounts. And this, like we were saying, just a base. If, as you see, you don't see any anything fancy there. This is just the, the fundamentals. Louis and Louis, uh, maybe you'll uh -huh. go over this later too, but when you're making jerky from different types of meat, do you treat or marinate them differently? Pork versus beef, venison, et cetera. The, um, pretty close to the same. The one thing that you will notice is that different types of meat, different types of meat have like a, you know, beef on its own has more flavor than chicken, for instance. So, so you may have to use uh, more spices in the, the beef one than a chicken one, just because uh, the, you know, they say like chicken kind of tastes like whatever you put on it and the uh, versus a uh, beef or venison has more of its own flavor. So that's something to keep in mind um, would be the main difference, but otherwise, you know, it would treat it close to the same. You know, sometimes there's some spices that complement different species more than others. Like you normally wouldn't put like uh, uh, a sage and on, on, on beef, but you would put it on turkey or chicken, um, you know, um, or sometimes with, with uh, poultry, uh, more onion or celery uh, or brown sugar is more appropriate than some of the other species. Um, so that's, that's you are you're right, it can be species specific. I, I guess a lot of times the wild game, people expect something maybe a little more robust too, as well, so. Uh, jerky flavors, I, we kind of alluded to this at the beginning, but the sky's the limit, Sm uh, like the ones, some of the ones we have here, uh, smoky, barbecue, Cajun, Italian, pepper, teriyaki, house. Sweet and hot, um, hot and spicy. Okay, so with that, I think uh, we're, at, we're at the end of the PowerPoint there. Well, here we have some uh, sliced beef that we prepared ahead of time. Uh, here, if Louis want to show how we got that up here. So this is uh, some sliced uh, beef round. So it's basically just a, a round steak that's uh, sliced uh, Thin, like I said, about a quarter inch, or this might even be a little bit less here. And uh, so we have, uh, we have five pounds in each of these uh, containers here. Um, and commercially, jerky is uh, expensive and hard to make because there's no way to mechanize it. You can mix it, but you still have to lay everything out. Uh, maybe Louis, you can take a quick pan over to this. Uh, here's like a big commercial rack. We have a jerky right now that we're preparing to smoke tomorrow. And you can see on this particular rack, there's uh, like around 280 pounds of jerky, which we'll be smoking tonight for tomorrow. And there's big pieces like that. And uh, this is uh, a, a commercial way of doing it, but somebody had to lay all those uh, pieces off manually one at one. There's no way, there's no machine that can do that except for people. And so um, that's, that's the, the commercial end of it. But at home, uh, those just showed you the, the different pieces there. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna start with a, uh, a 
we'll just call it original jerky. We have uh, spice kits that we talked about. Uh, this is one that we developed ourselves. It's just Louis original jerky. It's got two packs to it. One pack's enough for five pounds of meat. It's got um, this particular one. It's uh, got brown sugar, salt, spices, uh, garlic, onion, uh, red bell pepper, spice extras, and parsley flakes. Just dressing up. And the bottom was the salt, sugar, and cure in it, which is separate. Uh, but Louis, you want to show a couple of and, You know, you might want to think on the jerky, like you said, the uh, parsley flakes and the, the piece of pepper. As soon as you want to look at the appearance, you want to see uh, that on the finished product. More of a topical spice, which we'll go into. We sell a, a lot of different types of kits. This is a mesquite, uh, for example. I think this one uh, is a sweet onion teriyaki. Um, and this particular one's from, uh, you know, these are our recipes from PS Seasoning, which is a Wisconsin uh, based company. And here's like one that's just called buttery prime rib jerky. Uh, and and uh, we have uh, this, uh, barbecue bacon. So, and then plus they make it easy. They're all weighed out, measured, ready to go with all the directions on how to do it. And of course, we're more than willing to help ourselves but this shows you what's out there. There's a lot of different ones out there and we sell a, really a lot of these types of products in our store. I a popular one is our original one, which we'll show you right now. And that's the most popular item that we sell, the jerky that we have, just the original jerky. And I guess my recommendation would be to uh, start with a, you know, original type recipe, then you can always uh, doctor it up yourself. If you decide you want it to be spicier, you could add some uh, red pepper, some more red pepper, or some habanero, or whatever you want. Or if you want it sweeter, you could add, you know, some honey or some maple sugar or whatever you want to do. So there's a, uh, you can kind of make it your own by uh, experimentation. So and as far as recipes go, excuse me, Louis Lewis, as far as recipes go, would people look online? Are there some that, you recommend, or there's some on your website, or? Yeah, so, um, you know, you can look online. You saw that we posted in the PowerPoint that you have, uh, you know, kind of a, a real basic recipe, and that'd be a good starting point. Otherwise, you know, looking online, there's all kinds of uh, different books. So here's, that have, are full of uh, recipes. So, you know, jerky, the Jerky Bible, how to dry cure and preserve beef, venison, and fish, and fowl. Jerky holic make great jerky. Um, so you know, there's so that's just three examples of books that are out there. And if uh, you know you want to get serious about it, you know certainly think that then you can find all kinds of different variations. But uh, the basic recipe that we have posted there would be a good starting point, and you can uh, go from there. So uh, moving forward, then. Uh, the, the jerky would uh, the meat would go into a glass bowl or a Ziploc bag, and we would put the meat in the uh, container. And like I, it, uh, like I said, this is the uh, original jerky one. And so, and it's already pre-measured for five pounds of meat, which I have. And um, you take that and sprinkle that on the product. You want to kind of move it around while you're doing it. So you don't have a good big clump at the beginning. Uh, and like I, I mentioned what the, the spices were in this. And then um, the second one has salt and sugar in it. So that's your opportunity if you need to control your salt or sugar, you can go from there. So then usually it's like around 5% water or, you know, or so. So in this original jerky here, I'm going to start with just like a half a cup of water and um, put that on it. And I'm also going to put a little uh, um, soy sauce, but of course you have to be aware of different allergens and stuff like that. You can't have soy or whatnot. Well, now you have to control it. And so, you know, and usually a, a lot of jerky has soy sauce in it. If you, uh, you know, have a lot of soy sauce, that would make it a, a teriyaki. And then in this one, we're gonna put in a little uh, liquid smoke because uh, 
just to uh, do it. And that's like Louis was saying, we need to be sparingly about it. So normally we're not gonna be an Italian chef here and just dump, start dumping stuff in. We wanna measure it. Uh, the reason being is that you wanna keep records. You wanna know what you did and say, well, I put in a half a tablespoon. Next time I went, I should put in three fourths of a tablespoon uh, because I want more smoke. But if you, if you do it Italian style and just dump it in there indiscriminately, it's hard to keep track of it. Unless there's nothing wrong with doing it that way. It's just that if you want to be able to uh, recreate what you did or change what you did, you need to keep record somehow. So here you can either use uh, tongs, but if you got some gloves, you can move this around. Now the trouble is a lot of times when you slice it, the stuff sticks together. So you're going to want to keep moving along, moving around. Uh, it's uh, if, if we're doing it in a commercial mixer, you, we don't want to overdo it because then it starts getting sticky and uh, it's, it's hard to, to rack. Uh, so basically what uh, he's trying to do there is uh, get it so that it's evenly uh, distributed so that there's uh, spices over all the meat. Yeah, because you know, otherwise they said it was stuck together and might be a piece in the middle that doesn't have any spices on it. So you're uh, trying to mix it up the best you can to get it uh, distributed all the way through there. And so at this point then, you can, it, well, I like the amount of water that I put in it because it makes all the spices nice, but it's not so watery that it's gonna take forever to dry. And plus it gives the marin or the spices and stuff an opportunity to, to, to mix into the meat. Now, then you wanna seal this up so it doesn't dry. And then if you have, a, 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 you can, there's no crime in racking it right now. It's not gonna be as flavorful because it won't have an opportunity to marinate quite as long. And, and if you do this now and before you go to bed, you do it again. And in the morning you do it again before you lay it out on the racks. But if you can do it for overnight, eight, 10 hours, so much better. So then now I got this one sealed up and um, this will be ready for us to rack later on. Uh, the second batch, same meat, same everything like that, what we're gonna do is we're gonna put it in a, a, a gallon uh, size Ziploc bag and uh, we'll, we'll go from there. So I, I think I'll put it in, a, I'll do a pan first. So if you wanna grab um, one of those little white pans over here. To your right, to your right. And in this batch, we're going to make from this one kit a uh, honey barbecue. Yes. So, um, here we go. That one has a little dusty on it, sir. There we go. So here we go. Um, you see, it's a different uh, spice. It's hard to see in the screen, but it's uh, you know a lot more uh, sugar, and it doesn't have uh, the big pieces of uh, black pepper in it. And here we will. Uh, I think you get a better mix by using your hands because you don't have to. You can get all pieces separated. I can smell the uh, barbecue uh, and the honey coming out.
Now maybe a, like a honey barbecue might be more appropriate for a pork jerky. Um, so the question about different meats for different spices. So, I mean, you know what spice is so good with other products. It's so different than jerky or wild game or anything like that. So here, now you see this looks different. Um, it's hard to tell the lighting here and stuff, but um, we can see that this almost looks uh, sticky because it has all the, the honey and the, the sugars in it. You know, and that's uh, one thing if, uh, as he's talking about using uh, local items, well, a couple of uh, sugar sources are big Wisconsin items, you know, honey and maple syrup. And those are things that you could uh, you know, make your own maple syrup or honey that uh, you could use right in your recipe. Uh, so here, this one, we had a glass bowl on. This one we'll put into a Ziploc bag. And um, and so the, the same thing is that uh, like you said, you could uh, rack that right now, but we would recommend uh, letting it sit overnight so it helps uh, soak in the salt and spices into the meat better. And so then you can, uh, uh, like I said, if we go to bed, you flip it around a little bit or you open it up and mix it around a little bit just to keep it uh, moving. And so now, in short order, we got 10 pounds of jerky going here. Um, and uh, so the next thing is that you would marinate this under refrigeration. Okay, this time you're going to put it in the garage if you don't have a, a dog or, or the idea is to put your refrigerator so it's at a, a set temperature, you know, 40 degrees or slightly under. Um, just just uh, it's, at this point, it's still basically raw meat that's, that has some salt, some cure, but it's um, used to be refrigerated. By the way, uh, Johnny or Joni asks that she doesn't see the jerky kits online. Is that something you can only get in the shop there? Um, if, uh, if we want to ship you, uh, I think we, I thought we had a couple of them listed online, but I know we don't have these PS ones. We had our, our own original one. But if, uh, if you don't see it on our website, if we want to ship you, you can uh, just give us a phone call and uh, order it that way. We can certainly, uh, ship anything to you you know what we have listed on our website is kind of uh, limited but uh, anything we have like that we can certainly uh, send if you call and order over the phone or email so one of the questions that came up earlier about the different marinade and i, I did the soy sauce but you know um what's your soy sauce um, you see out there in the market the tame game different marinades like this there's no crime in adding uh, uh, anything even from Tabasco to control the heat, that even uh, a, a steak sauce. Uh, and then you go into all the different, um, go ahead, look like this one's a Tennessee whiskey uh, flavored marinade. So there's, uh, and then you can put the topicals on it. Here we've got a California garlic, uh, or we've got a, uh, a hickory char and thyme uh, that you, you sprinkle on the top of. of of these things afterwards, sparingly, of course, you don't want to go crazy on. This one is uh, uh, maple whiskey flavor. So there's different things that you can do to give it a different, your own, put your own little print on. As I said, you can put uh, your maple syrup or honey right in there to mix that in. If you, and a lot of it depends on how much uh, sweetness you want. Again, personal preference. Um, so we'll, we'll go do a little, uh, racking thing here, but one of the always question is when is it done? And when is it done is is uh, when it reaches your when it uh, reaches the food safety part and uh, reaches the desired dryness that you want it in. Um, there's the, the one of the mis things in the meat business that people say, well, oh, he a guy or a guy will come up to the meat counter and he'll just say. I want the real thin, dry ones. And the next customer will come up and say, I want the thicker, wetter ones. I mean, they'll even specify what kind they want. 
So it shows you right there that there's differentials on what people like and want. But uh, in the inspection world, like we said at the beginning, tall jerky has got to be 50% of what it started at. Not if we added all the goodies to it, just so the meat itself. So when we are doing jerky, like I said, in this big rack here, we weigh six big pieces and we put it on the scale and we separate it on the smoke truck. We weigh it before, we weigh it after it comes out. If it's not at the weight where it should be, it's got to go back from the smoke house and drive for a little bit longer. Why is it different? Difference in thickness, uh, even the ambient temperature. I mean, the humidity and, uh, of the outside world, and temperature, stuff like that, all can vary how long it takes up to dry. So it's not, jerky isn't one of those things you say, well, it dries in two hours, 20 minutes. It, it, it'll change with every batch. So that's why if you're drying something at home, you should be there to keep an eye on it. So you can kind of eyeball it and see how it's going. Um, um, like we said at the beginning, desired jerky is not crunchy. Um, it's not soggy, but different customers have different ideas. Um, the shape, the thickness, the type of meat all dictate uh, how long it takes for it to dry and or if it comes to the desired texture that we want. Um, so let's try a couple of these guns here. So, so we're not going to uh, mix up the actual restructured jerky we talk about. We'll show you the equipment you would use. You use a similar recipe as we use there, except that you're using ground meat. You're basically making a sausage, or you'd mix it all up together. And then you and, and like a pot gun, you, you pump it out and, and, and put it out on your screens uh, with that. Here, this one particular one came with a couple of attachments, so that you can have like a real thin, a real thin jerky or a, a snack stick one. Or the traditional size uh, jerky one, um, as you can see. And then uh, here's a different brand uh, that we have. And uh, same thing, basically. And it's got the different, the different horns to accommodate the, the, the jerky size and, and everything. And uh, I think, you know, it, this is okay, but it would take a long time to even do five pounds, but it, it's it's an option that's out there. Um. Louis and Lewis, we had another question about uh, oven versus dehydrator. And if you could talk a little bit more about how you would use the two and how it would differ. And then again, just to remind folks when they should get the meat up to temperature for food safety purposes, like that's at the end of the process, right? Right, and so when you're, the, the beginning part of it, we recommend that you try to smoke it like, you know, or cook it or dry it, maybe you know, like 145 degrees, which gets you over the, the threshold of, of spoilage, uh, and then ramp it up to, at, at some point during the process, 160 degrees, uh, for like beef and pork, 165 degrees for wild game and uh, poultry. poultry. Does that sound fair? Well, right. And then, how I asked before, after, um, you know, on a commercial basis, you know, our inspection wants us to actually do it beforehand when there's still humidity in the house and then dry it. Um, but uh, on a home basis, I think that'd be easier to probably do it at the end, you know, to, uh, just to make sure it's being up to temp. And that's where, uh, you know, if you're talking about dehydrator, and it's hard for me to say, and I don't know exactly what equipment you're using. As we've said, you can use an oven dehydrator, a smoker, any of the above. Um, you know, the oven, you'll be able to uh, cook it in there, but uh, a dehydrator might not have heat. And so that's something you have to watch. If, uh, you know, some people will take it once you get a dry to the where you want and just put it in the oven for a little bit to, uh, Make sure you're getting it up to the right temperature. The, the best thing is that if you, you get a dehydrator or a smoker that you can control the temperature, that's huge because, like, the, this de, uh, uh, dehydrator that we have right here is actually a jerky setting. It says 68 hours at 155 degrees, which makes a whole lot of sense, but it's not going to get to 160 degrees the threshold. Which, and so you can finish that off the way you want. Here's an example of some different. Racks 
on a home type deal. This is the, we have a little smoke house here in front of us here, a home one, little rack like that, which is the, uh, or here's the dehydrator rack. Um, you can, if, if you want to, sometimes with stuff with a lot of sugar and, and, and whatnot, you don't want the stuff to stick to it. You can um, spray it like a little pan or rub a mineral oil or uh, shortening on here if you, if you have trouble with stuff sticking. It depends on the spice base that you have a lot of times. Like with Louis' original one or original jerky without a whole lot of sugar is usually not a problem. But maybe something like a sweet and hot where you've got uh, a lot of uh, sugar in the molasses or honey, you, there's nothing worse than having a big mess. You can also line the bottom of your dehydrator or the smokehouse or your oven, like I said, with oil or a pan so that um, uh, you don't have a mess at the end of the day. So that being said, uh, well, if you want to take this and really show how we do and I'll hold the rack, how we do the We always, I always say that if you stack up the, the dehydrator, you don't want to put too much in there. You want, like Phyllis said, you're better off to have three batches that are spread out than to have one batch that everything's wet. So, and then the other thing is that, is so we like to have chimneys in the dehydrator, chimneys in the smokehouse, so that the, the, the air has a chance to percolate around. Uh, around. And then, uh, so I know it's a uh, tempting. I think, uh, you know, the first uh, job I had here when he was a kid was uh, racking turkeys. As I said, it's tempting to see how much you can fit on there. But, you know, I would recommend leaving some space in between the pieces just for the airflow. That uh, you want to have it so that the air can flow through there, otherwise, it's going to take a lot longer to dry. So, let's say you're putting that in an oven, then what temperature would you want the oven to be at? I, I, if I was putting it in, a, in an oven, uh, you lay it on the, right on the rack itself, or you can have, uh, uh, if you put a cookie sheet or something in there you need to have some kind of a rack elevator. You can't put it right on the cookie sheet. And I would start it up uh, uh, like it's almost as low as you can get it, like around, you know, 130, 140 degrees. Low. So that's all about right. right. And then ramp it up towards the end. Um, because uh, at the beginning, you're more looking at uh, drying it, not uh, cooking it. So, and how long would you would you have it either in a dehydrator or in the oven so that it gets dry enough? The, the well, like there again, like we talked about, it, it, it talks the, the, some of the factors are the ambient temperature, thickness of the meat, the uh, amount that you've got in the oven, the type of oven you need to gas, especially the humidity. But usually, and, and, the, and the humidity and how much water you've got to start with. So, that's what makes different. That's what's different about jerky is that it's not uh, put in the oven for 47 minutes and it's done. It's got to be, uh, but as a kind of a rule of thumb, you're usually looking at like, you know, four or five hours for starters, you know. And then uh, you're, and you're going to want to keep checking it until it gets to, to the texture uh, that you want. So it's kind of a lot of trial and error. And they said the next time you make it, it might be different if it's somewhere from the day that uh, it's harder to write things out, for instance. So, now, now, this is the stuff that they have in your drawer at home, but it's what it's called the roast beef needle. And you can, you, you know what I'm trying to do here. You do it with a knife and you just plug it through. But here, you take a, a piece of twine and you can uh, uh, stick it right through the meat or you do it with a knife too. I mean, uh, of course, do the same thing. And um, when you, uh, tie this and uh, here. Now you can hang the Indian style on uh, the, in, in your smokehouse or your oven or whatnot, uh, and then you have to rack. So that is a way you do the, the hanging method or you saw one of those pictures where they actually stuck uh, wooden skewers right through it and put several pieces on there. But that'd be the hanging way of jerky and you know, that also works if you don't have the right kind of rack. You know, either way, 
the key is to have good airflow all the way around it, whether you're laying it on a rack or if you're uh, hanging it. And uh, they said that a Kogi sheet wouldn't work very well because there's no holes on it, so the air is not flowing through that. And anybody that's got uh, experiences at home with jerky, it's not a bad form to do it because we don't do it at home. Uh, it's, it's like we should, so what we're trying to tailor is to, if you were doing it at home, uh, we've got the technology behind it and we've got the um, everything, but we're not really veterans at using the smaller equipment, and, but uh, we're willing to learn and we know and that's there's a market out there for this sort of thing. And is there a way to know for sure if it's adequately dry? I mean, I know there are differences in, you know, ambient temperature and the water and the meat and your personal preference can vary, but is there something that says, okay, I now know it's dry enough or? So the, um, so the, you know, a lot of it, like you said, would be on the, the texture that you're looking for. You know, you can kind of tell if it's still uh, really rubbery or it looks more like a steak than jerky, then it's probably not finished enough. But uh, it, a general rule of thumb is that it gets down to half the way you serve with. So if you um, start with five pounds of meat and then, uh, you know, if you could have a scale and weigh it so that it's two and a half pounds, then that's probably about where you want to be at. Um, the jerky should, like we said, shouldn't be crunchy, but it shouldn't be soggy. If you can take it and, and, and still bend it without a breaking or, or bend it where you need to put a little work into it, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty well uh, done. If, you, if you're worried about any food safety or anything like that, if you put it in the uh, 275 oven for 10 minutes, your worries are over. You're not, it's not going to be raw and it's not going to get burned up or anything. Um, and then um, you can still always dry a little further past that if you want to. Um, if, it's, if you say, geez, this still is too wet for what I like. It, well, I'm not trying to make it too complicated. It's just, we're just trying to, um, we want the best product that you can turn out with the time and money that you're putting into the, the product itself and spices and, and everything like that. And then we do the same thing here too. Uh, a lot of times the, we'll have one of the kids will come to unrack it and, and I say, well, we want to check it first. So they know this has a little bit of ways to go yet, even though it passed the threshold of the 50% rule, we still would rather look at the quality part of it than the, what the state has to say about it. Um, you make any sense? <laughs> Absolutely. It's just helpful to have some of these things reiterated that folks have questions about, but I think it's getting clearer. Yeah. Um, now, one more show and tell thing is that we're pretty proud of this. This is a, a gold medal that we got in, in Germany in 2018 for uh, uh, beef jerky. And uh, jerky, not that that's a huge acclamation in Germany because they, they're not really big experts on jerky. So they love it when Americans come over there. So they want to learn how to make jerky. They want to make jerky because they know jerky is kind of unique to the United States. Like we said, well, of course, it's been a worldwide deal. But in Europe, you don't see a lot of it. And so uh, it was kind of fun to go there and talk to these uh, uh, people about how to make jerky. And they, they, would, they, they actually wanted uh, us to... Uh, get a team to come over there to do a demonstration on making jerky. Probably not too much more than what we did here, except we'd be a little more, more commercial basis. But the, um, um, and yeah, so and that's it, some an interesting point you made there. Like if, if we go to Europe, we're interested in all the old world European style sausages, but you know they look at the same thing that they're American things that they don't really make, and so it goes both ways. Anywhere you go in the world, there's different types of products and that. Uh, you know, I think with uh, jerky, it goes all the way back to Native Americans, and that is something that's been made forever. So, um, congratulations on your medal. Yeah, I, I haven't figured out a way to wear it yet, but you know, maybe. <laughs> um, I, I guess what I'd like to do before we keep uh, bantering on here is, is answer some more questions because 
then we really find out what you really want to, to uh, the best we can to answer it. Great, yeah. Um, Scott asks, can you talk a little bit about storage? And then do you have a smoker you'd recommend for the home? You said spoilage? Uh, storage. Oh, storage, okay. Um, yeah, what uh, what I would do is that, uh, like we said, you're making it so it's a shelf-stable product. However, uh, you know, if you can, um, if you're keeping it for a really long time, if you do have a way to vacuum seal it, you can, that's not totally necessary, but, um, you know, it will last longest that way. Um, otherwise, you know, even just Ziploc bags, whatever you have at home. Um, and, uh, you know, you're making it, you're designing it so that it's, uh, doesn't need refrigeration, but if you're keeping it a long time, I probably would anyways, um, just to make sure, because like I said, the jerky can uh, reabsorb some moisture from uh, the atmosphere. So it's not gonna hurt it any if you put it into a fridge or a freezer um, if you uh, want to. But uh, the big thing is to, you know, keep it packaged so it stays clean and doesn't uh, reabsorb all the moisture and get soggy again. As far as smokers go, Jerky isn't really smoked for a huge amount of time. Um, it's more of the drying mechanism. So any kind of smokehouse that you have, if you can, um, if, if you can feel that there's some airflow, I mean, there's two different types of smokehouses with the airflow type one or just a gravity house, it might take a longer time and, and just a house where there's no air moving. Um, you know, if you can keep the door open, the crank, if you can, uh, uh, just so the air fluctuating, that's the key to jerky. You know, some people might even uh, find a way to uh, get a fan there next to uh, the smoker or whatever they're using to uh, keep the air moving. You know, we have, uh, and so there's all kinds of smokers out there. You know, we, obviously the, the pellet ones are popular now. And the same thing as any of those will work fine, especially for getting the flavor. I guess the, the bigger thing is to uh, see how you can keep air moving in there so that it uh, will dry it out. You know, there's some people that have luck uh, doing jerky on a grill. A lot of times, uh, unless there's the air moving and they usually are a little too hot for jerky, it's hard to keep the temperature down um, enough, like we were saying, to dry it adequately. You don't want it to get crunchy, you know? Yeah, and once you, uh, if you cook it into a hard steak, it's a lot harder to uh, get to dry after that. So you don't want to overcook it right away at the beginning either. It's uh, like a shell on the outside and so raw in the middle, well, it's not gonna dry right. And then you're gonna have, you wonder why you started the project in the first place. So to go at a snail's pace, keep the good records, uh, keep um, air moving, keep everything clean and cold to begin with, um, you know, all kind of rules of thumb, keep good records of what you did because every piece of equipment's different. You know, it's, I, it's somebody calls you up and they say, well, how long should I grill a steak for? It's really hard because you don't know uh, how thick the steak is, what they're using for a fire source, so on and so forth. So you have to kind of, um, uh, there are rules of thumb though. So and then we, I try to, we try to express that tonight a little bit. And do different types of animals dry at different rates or is it strictly the thickness? So could you dry the turkey and beef at the same time, let's say if it's the same thickness? Um, there's probably, you know, some differences, uh, depending on the species, but I think that the, the bigger factor that you would notice at home is, uh, the thickness, you know, there's, uh, there's some, uh, I would say like maybe beef might hold more water in than the chicken does, but, uh, I think that the biggest difference you would see is, uh, the thickness. And is there anything special or unique about venison since that's such a big uh, item around here to, to think about as far as venison goes? Um, just uh, well, when we were touching on the spices that, uh, you know, you may want to use a little stronger uh, spices with venison versus something that was a, a milder meat like a, a poultry. And just, uh, you know, with wild game, we always urge caution that, uh, you know, it starts when you're in the field with proper field dressing and keeping it cold. If it's a hot day to find a way to get it cooled down quickly. 
So it, it, we just always use a little more caution with wild game and we're hunters ourselves. So we know, but you're, uh, that things happen, but you have to just try to pay a little more attention to the quality, especially with wild game and the, and maybe find the spices that tailor it. And if you, think, if you think you're going to be doing some jerky out of your wild game, then uh, at the very beginning, keep the big whole muscles, the sterling tips and the rounds uh, separate uh, and well marked so that when it comes time to get it, you didn't have it all cut up in the stakes already or ground up or something like that. Um, some people will come in and they'll have a, a 80 pound box of venison and they'll say, yeah, if you find any good pieces in there, make jerky for me. Well, I, we just really, <laughs> I said, I think it's really hard to, to do it unless it's segregated at the beginning and um, everything, so. Great, thank you. And Scott did ask something along the lines of, you know, for storage, how many days can you have it on the shelf? And then when should you move it into the fridge or the freezer, I think is what he's asking. Um, and that probably depends more on the packaging. I mean, if, uh, you know, and that's why you might wonder if you see a, a commercial jerky on the shelf and it has a, a sell-by date that's uh, a couple of years out or something, you might see, well, how can it last that long? Well, it, theoretically, it should last forever if it's in a sealed package and there's no moisture in there. You know, it's uh, preserved by uh, drying. But uh, so I guess, you know, to answer that question, it's more of how you're, uh, you're storing it if you're able to uh, keep it sealed and uh, protected. It would, uh, it was it contaminated during the uh, packaging process, like say with some wet hands or some wine or beer in your hands or some sugar or something like that. Um, you know, so everything, uh, that's part of the deal too. Sometimes it's, it's everything's fine, but then it gets a little moisture when it goes. Like for example, like some bar will have jerky on a jug at the end of the bar. Well, the bartender's reaching in there uh, and there's, uh, next thing you know is that there's a little moisture in the jar. Next thing you know is there's a mold issue. Well, that's because it wasn't packaged properly or it was cross-contaminated. So that's, it kind of depends on, on, on that. Like we said, we sent jerky to Iraq uh, uh, quite a bit, actually. And sometimes it was a couple of months out before they got it in their hands and got there fine. So, but I think the issue you'll find with jerky, um, if it's not uh, sealed, which I know, you know, you probably don't have a vacuum sealer at home. Some people do, those food saver bags, but is that uh, it may get moldy eventually. And so that's probably your biggest issue, you know, rather than bacteria be growing mold on it, which uh, you'd be able to see. Um, so, I, you know, if you're in Cuba for a long time, I would just recommend keeping in the fridge or the Freezer is just similar to if I have uh, homemade bread that that uh, seems to stays a lot longer without growing mold if I just put it in the refrigerator. So even though it's safe to leave it on the counter, it's just gonna last longer that way. Even though it's uh, theoretically you know, shelf stable. No, no, no crime in the refrigerator. Yeah. And even the freezing, for that matter, you know, stops everything until you pull it out again. Uh, you can see, you know, uh, at one point the conversation came up that we could do the sausage and jerky on the same seminar, and I didn't want to do it that way because I wanted to give this justice. I want to give the sausage justice. So I, I'm hope I'm hoping that this was beneficial uh, to people. We're always available here. I mean, you can come and call us or, or stop in or whatnot anytime, and we're happy to share it because um, if, if if people like jerky. They're not only going to like their own, but they'll like ours as well. So we appreciate the opportunity to do this for everybody here tonight. We'd sure like to answer some more questions if there's any out there. Well, first of all, just to let you know that folks are typing in their thanks and appreciation, Louis and Lewis. Uh, and I, I want to echo that. Um, you guys obviously put a lot of thought into this and you know preparation to have everything available to us as you show us things in the PowerPoint. So just really want to acknowledge that for one and also encourage all of us to support this kind of, you know, local business uh, and, and get up there to Cumberland or send or send an email and order something online. So really appreciate that. And of course, yeah, if, if there are other questions, feel free to type oh, in folks. 
you know, and the biggest thing is feel free to uh, contact us down the road if you're, um, a lot of times you think of the questions once you uh, have a problem and that, uh, you know, and you shouldn't be ashamed if it doesn't work out for you because that's the only way you learn is uh, a lot of trial and error. So that, uh, you know, if you're running into problems, you're making it and you contact us and we'll try to help you out the best that we can. Um, because we uh, enjoy this sort of thing, a little troubleshooting. And... Great, I just typed in um, their email, and, or sorry, their website and phone number again. So that's handy for you folks. Uh, and Johnny or Joni, I'm sorry, I don't know how to say your name, says yours is by far the best rookie she's ever had. So, well, thank you. And uh, yeah, that's a great that's a great recommendation there. And just a few minutes earlier, I did type in our phone number for the restaurant. We're open for distance, socially distance, in person dining, as well as typed in our website for our upcoming programs. And I will say that I'll send out a recording of this if you want to review it or take a look at it again or send it to a friend. But um, all of our classes now, since we've gone online a year ago today, pretty much, right, um, are all now on our YouTube channel. And one of those classes on Farm Table Foundation's YouTube channel is the sausage making class that we did with Louie and Lewis just a month ago. So you could also watch that one. Uh, but again, I'll get that out to you, might even be tomorrow or, or shortly, so you all can, can watch this again if you like to. Louie and Lewis, anything else you'd like to say? Um, I don't think so. Just uh, thank you for uh, bearing with us there and uh, hope that you got something out of it. And uh, our, our first preference is to do it, uh, you know, live uh, because we can answer some more questions and it's hard to really show the demonstrating. And plus you have an opportunity to do some probably on, um, on hand yourself, but Better days are coming, so we'll work in that direction. Yes, exactly. We may well be able to have the two of you down to farm table. And then maybe this fall we can be together. Let's hope so. Uh, and if uh, there's any other uh, uh, thoughts about something else that we can do, we're we're happy to to strongly consider it. Well, thank you. Wonderful. Well, thank you, everybody, for a nice evening, for your attention and, and interest in what these guys are all about. And Louis Lewis, thank you for, for your time tonight. I hope, to, you. hope to see you in the store someday before too long. Okay, thank you. Take care. Thank you. What's oh, on the back of Lewis's jacket? Um, yeah. So we both got a Master Recrafter coat on that, uh, and this is a logo. Uh, it's a it's course that the state of Wisconsin has that we both uh, graduated from. So it's uh, like a two-year uh, program with a series of short courses uh, through the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And uh, so we both uh, completed that, but it's a great program that uh, you know goes through all different areas of meat processing. Um, and it's uh, you know currently been on hold with uh, COVID, but they're talking about starting it up again as soon as they can. Um, with uh, and the, the state just recently built a brand new uh, meat science facility in Madison that's uh, that just opened this year, but they haven't been able to let many people into it yet. So very interesting. Wow. Yeah, these guys have a lot of training. I know that there's they both have bachelors and and. Lewis has a, a master's, I believe, in meat science. Or so, uh, but your your training really shows, and we appreciate your sharing your knowledge with us. All right, I don't see any other questions coming in, so uh, I guess we'll sign off and say good night. But thank you, everyone, for joining. Good night. Thank you. All right. Good night, Thanks. everybody. Good night.